Um, my, oh, my name is Victoria Sims. I am the, a reader in developmental psychology and child psychology. And I'm also the research director for the School of Psychology at Ulster University. Um, and I'll hand you over to Abby Cahoon. Hello. Um, yes, so my name is Dr. Abby Cahoon um, and I work at Ulster University. Before we start, I would like to uh, thank uh, the funder of this event, so uh, ESRC, Social Science Festival, um, who are running a week-long event and I think we are the opening event. Um, so, yay! <laughs> <laughs> this uh, session has, is being recorded, but uh, your phone, your microphone should be automatically um, muted and if you ha we really want you to uh, be engaged in the session so please do ask any questions in the uh, throughout the entire session in the uh, chat box um, I think it'd be really beneficial to get some engagement uh, going on so please feel free to uh, ask as many questions as you want um, so yes this session is called um, uh, let's play with numbers um, We've already introduced ourselves, but I feel the need to point out that on this slide, we have uh, Dr. Victoria Sims' daughter in the top right-hand corner and um, playing with her dinosaurs. Um, so she will feature in this presentation um, a lot <laughs> um, because uh, you can see that she's got our dinosaurs uh, counted out. Um, and yeah, just really good uh, visualization of what's uh, going on uh, in, uh, Victoria's home um, to do with numbers. So um, yeah, let's so yeah, the home environment. Let's talk about that. Um, the home math environment. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, the um, home math environment. Uh, math has been found to be uh, related to those interactions that parents and children are doing in the home. Um, they're very beneficial. Um, research has found that they're beneficial for maths achievement later in life. And uh, what we know in research is that uh, there are individual differences um, in how children um, understand mathematical concepts, uh, numbers, uh, and shapes and space. Um, prior to those children going into formal education, um, and, as in P1, um, and these kind of persist beyond. Um, uh, when in schooling but this uh, what we find what this research has found that is that the home environment uh, although there we we don't know exactly know the pinpointed uh, items that we should be doing with our children it's still really important that we are um, we are doing these interactions with our, our, our children before they go to school so that we uh, can generate a really um, make them aware of certain um, words um, and uh, other activities. Um, so yeah, maths is related to um, later maths on, later on. Um, so the next slide, um, this is really interesting. So this is data that it's been in um, Northern Ireland. 308 parents were involved in doing a questionnaire to find out what they were doing in their home with their children so uh, the kind of three four or five year olds and um, this uh, questionnaire was filled out um, in relation to and so what were parents doing daily almost daily um, with their children well there was counting and um, that is uh, was the most with 48 percent of parents saying that they count with their children almost daily this is a little different from the next one where 45 percent of uh, parents were counting objects so when i say the 48 percent they're counting maybe out loud with their children they don't have any abstract things that they're counting with their children they're just counting out loud um so counting objects is really it's really common uh, 40 with 45 percent of parents counting objects with their children almost daily so this could be any type of, of uh, objects so it could be counting out little dinosaurs um, as we saw or it could be uh, counting out toy cars it could be anything that the uh, children are, are interested in um, the there's also 41 percent of uh, parents were letting their children watch educational tv programs so this is uh, really a beneficial can be really beneficial um, over and above you know other non-educational programs so it's interesting that uh, a lot of parents are allowing their uh, children to watch educational programs um quite common but that 35 percent of children at that age group are um counting on their fingers in the home 
And then this is again counting out objects, so food, plates, cut, uh, cutlery. So this is kind of around meal times, um, and uh, that's thirty four percent counting out using mathematical language in a um, environment where uh, we would sit down and sit um, with our children and eat. So uh, they're counting out objects like that. Now these last two are a little different because it's shape and space. So uh, playing with building blocks, where there were 29% of parents playing with building blocks almost daily with their children. And then playing with jigsaws as well, 22%. So maths can come in lots of different ways. And it's not that uh, just as simple as, as counting with, a parent, uh, with your children. You can actually do shape and space with them and lots of other geometry type terms, which seem scary but they're actually not, they're quite uh, simple. Um, and Victoria will explain all these th things to you. So you should have all got a pack in the last week. Um, Victoria has one of them. Uh, <laughs> she'll go through everything that's within that pack. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Abby. So I suppose you, you will re have received this little pack in the post, um, hopefully, but if not, I'm sure it's on its way to you. And within that pack, there are lots of little objects. And I think the first thing that we wanted to be able to do in this workshop was to say that numbers are everywhere in our environment. And sometimes um, in Abby's research, for example, um, we did some interviews with parents and it wasn't until parents started to really, really think that about things that they suddenly realized that they were doing quite a lot of number activities in the home they just didn't they, the par parents didn't really realize that what they were doing was related to number and um, it's quite different when I, I if I say to you um how often do you read with your child you probably go oh I read every night before I go before my kid goes to sleep because that's something that maybe isn't a pattern in your head or we read before we go to preschool or whatever but when we ask about number it's not as easy to define it's not as e easy to pinpoint so that's one thing and um, so if you have a little think about what thing while we're going through these types of activities how often you're doing these types of activities you're probably doing them quite spontaneously in the first place now I, we have things one thing that's really really important about our three to five year olds is as abby said sometimes we think about numbers and, and mathematics as being about numbers and about counting but actually mathematics is a really really broad repertoire of skills and the fundamental component of early number that sometimes gets completely overlooked is shape and space. And we know that shape and space is really important. So one of the first activities that we have within our little pack are these stencils. Now instantly, as a grown up person, I want to start to draw around these stencils. And this isn't what this is about. These stencils we can use as shaped telescopes like this, okay? and what we can do is we can ask our children to look through the shape and see if they can find shapes that match. So in my house right now, I'm just going to stand up. I can see that my shape can match over here by the, the door. I can't actually do that properly like this. There we go, which is my light switch. We've got a, a square here and I can map it onto the square. And actually this weekend, my daughter was running around the house trying to identify other squares. So lots of pictures in our house are this shape. Conveniently, I also have an oval and I have a nice mirror here that is the oval shape as well. So I can look through the shape to find matching shapes. And at, at three to five years old, we're not necessarily talking about identification or labeling. We're just looking for matching, okay? And what we know in terms of developmental trajectories or developmental learning is that once we start to be able to match shapes, we can then proceed to start to name shapes. So the important bit is this matching skill, looking through shapes. You don't have to use these shape telescopes or these stencils. Simple things can be also used like this, the toilet roll tube. <laughs> um, and again, you can look through, get your children to look through the toilet roll tube to be able to identify the shapes in their home environment. And then we can move on to starting to name what that shape is, the circle. Then we know in terms of development, what we start to be able to do is be able to name more complex shapes. So some people may have received in their little pack hexagons, um, triangles, diamonds. So it's all about matching first and then learning the word and then being able to learn more complex terms. Then as well within your pack, you would have received the, a little card and some objects to be able to make that shape with. So this is about taking the shape that we've been able to match, be able to, to 
find in our environment, not necessarily name, but now we're going to replicate, we're going to create. And we know that children who practice this type of patterning and matching seem to go on to have more mathematical learning success later on. So being able to find patterns in the environment is actually a core component of um, mathematics because mathematics is all about being able to find patterns, replications, um, and, and those kind of components that build up for us to be doing things like algebra, for example. And then also around, um, around shape is building blocks. Now, there is a huge body of developing evidence to suggest that children who are exposed to playing with building blocks go on to have um, better mathematical skills when they're older. And we think that the reason why this is, is if we're taking, for example, two blocks to fit together, we have to do mental rotation. We have to be able to think about how those blocks could be could be fitted together in our, in our minds. And this seems to be a really important underlying skill for mathematical development. We have data that suggests from the Millennium Cohort Study, which is a really large study that's tracked children who were born in 2000, right up to now, so they're 20 years old. And what that data has suggested is little children, three to five year olds, who play with building blocks have um, better mathematical achievement when they are in secondary school. Now, there's a huge gender issue within this data as well. We know that little boys are exposed to playing with building blocks significantly more than little girls. And so I would really encourage any parents here in this session who have little girls to make sure your girls have that opportunity as well as boys to play with building blocks. So these are things that we have given you to have a little uh, go with with your children. Um, building blocks, hopefully you might have some building blocks in your environment, but there's also shape and space around us um, in very simple things. So this is a little video of my daughter last night um, helping doing the tidying up, uh, the washing. Okay, sure. Um, first of all, the pride of being able to do a task, but also um, thinking about how that was a very, that, believe it or not, <laughs> it was a spontaneous activity that she engaged in. She just wanted to do it herself. But we can see how she's using her, her mental rotation skills, her visualization skills to be able to fold things in half and then in a quarter. And actually even being able to say those words, I could have really, I could have been um, making the environment even more numerically rich by saying to her, oh, half, quarter, getting her exposed to the, that type of language. So shape and space are all around us. We can do simple things with tea towels and toilet roll tubes. But if we have access to these kinds of pattern matching games as well, we know that this is a really useful type of task to engage with. And it's evidence-based. Oh, I'm gonna play that again. Now, then we move on to things about measurement. Now, we know that we have great opportunities to think about measurement and ex expose our children to think terms around measurement when we're cooking, for example. So we can think about size, weight, and comparing. Now, when we put into your little pack these lovely little, um, very child-friendly and safe <laughs> measuring tapes. Now, my, my, our metal measuring tapes may not be as um, accessible. We put this in not necessarily for you to encourage your child to use the measure, to use the numbers on the tape. The, ta the tape is here for us to be able to look at, for it to encourage children to match the tape onto objects and then to be able to compare different objects size. So we really, at this stage, at three to five year olds, we can be using this measuring tape to measure out things, but not necessarily thinking about the actual number that's associated with it. We're talking much more about the mathematical language that we can use when we're measuring. So thinking about when we're doing weight, heavy and light, adding more or less in terms of a recipe, and then comparing two things like this pen is uh, longer than this pen. So comparing two things together, so longer and shorter, heavier and lighter. So those measurement terms can be really used really simply within the home environment whilst we're doing lots of play. And what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to pop another video, I forgot to attach the video to this, um, of, of um, some mathematical language while we're cooking that um, my daughter and I have made a little a short video of. So when we're thinking about using this measuring tape, one of the games that you can play is to measure yourself in terms of your height and then 
make a little mark on the measuring tape because it's, you can put a pen mark onto this and then measure your child and compare who is taller and who is shorter. And that can be a really fun game. The other thing they could be doing is measuring the heights of teddies and toys in the home environment and measuring out who's, who is taller and who is shorter by using this little tape. So it's, it's really good fun to be able to mark, use a marker on this um, measuring tape to be able to do that comparison. I feel like I'm in a blue, I'm a blue Peter presenter with all my little bits and pieces. Um, so then we go, we move on to what we stereotypically think about mathematics, early mathematics. And this is around counting. So first of all, I know that my daughter, who is um, three and a half years old, can count, can uh, go through the number word list up to the number 10. And then all types of crazy stuff starts to happen after the number 10. We have all these random numbers that come along. But I, I know that she can count to 10. And we play lots of games around that. So we, she, we can, I can hear her counting sometimes just spontaneously by herself. But what does she actually understand? And so within your packs, you would have received um, some little animals. So I have, people have received different types of animals, but I have three little horses and three little ducks. Now, here is a type of game that you can play with your child to see what they understand. And this is Farah again, and she is, um, oh, I've just got noticed that people are waiting. Um, she is playing a game to see, well, she's not, she's, she's being quite defiant actually at the end of this, but anyway, um, a little game to see what, what number word does she understand with her pet llama. So this is something that you could try out at home. <laughs> Give your friend one food. Sweeties. Sweeties, yeah, good idea. Is that one? Yeah. Good job. Can you give him, listen, three foods? Three tips. Is that three? Yeah. Can you count them? One, two, three. Two cakes. Two cakes, good job. Now listen, can you give him one food? Give him whatever you want, one food. Good job. Can you give him, listen, can you give him, oh, one second. Can you give him two food? Two foods? Could you give him two foods, Farah? All right. Two foods. Is that two? Good job. Listen one more time. And you give him one food. Is that one? Oh, is that one? Fire check. Is that one? We don't two cakes. Yeah. Now listen carefully. Last one. Last one. Are you listening for the number? Oh no. Okay, listen. Can you give him? I, I, don't, I don't want to do it again. Right, I want you to do it one more time. Can you give him three foods? Yeah. That was the end of the game with Farah. So you can see that your friend. in this game, what we can do with these objects is ask your child to give a certain quantity to another toy. And they might use, give them one object, then maybe we go up to three objects, then we come down to two objects. And if your child can consistently give the quantity that you've asked for, we can kind of assume that they really understand that number word. And typically what we see in development is something that's really, really slow to develop is number word understanding. So we see that children maybe take about six months to learn what the number word one is then another six months to learn what the number word two is and then we start to see a slight acceleration of number word learning but it is a very very long protracted process that can take maybe two years for children to really solidly understand what number words mean and we refer to that as cardinality 
Then what we can do also with these objects is start to do things that are a little more complex once we've got some number word understanding. And you can see that we have two subsets within the full set of objects that I've given you. So we have six objects in total and we have three horses and three ducks. And what we can get children to do is try and get them to focus on, um, first of all, we can ask them how many horses there are, counting, focusing on one-to-one -one correspondence. So it's really, really helpful when children are learning to count that we have them in a set that is very easy to line up so that they can point to the object using the number word one, two, three. One-to-one -one correspondence. Every object has a unique number word name. And then we can ask how many ducks there are doing the same thing. Then we ask how many animals there are and we're starting to do basic addition. We can also say, we can also get them to recognize that a whole number, the number six, is made up of different smaller numbers three and three or two and four. And being able to focus on subsets is basically getting our kids to do basic addition, which is quite amazing at this age that they can actually engage in those processes. So making sure that the sets are nice line, nicely lined out for counting can be really helpful when they're starting to learn number words, but also being able to allow them to count if, uh, anything in their environment that's not lined up also really stretches those counting skills. And I'll show you a really nice example of how to do that in a few minutes. So counting is really fundamentally important. What we see is um, from some of the data that we have from Chinese children and Scottish children is that our Chinese, ch ch Chinese children are, have much better mathematical vocabulary in terms of counting. They have loads of number words in comparison to Scottish children at the same age, at four to, at, at four to five years old, so at, just as they start school. Um, and that seems to on, have ongoing impact on their later development in terms of more sophisticated mathematical achievement. So counting is really, really important. We can play lots of little games with things like this, but we can also encourage children to count things in the environment. Um, counting steps seems to be something that we all do. Um, counting ducks in the bath um, and being able to count out knives and forks and plates when we're setting the table. So counting we can do in any environment and it can be um, very exciting, very rewarding um, and engaging for our little ones. Then we move on to the world of books. Now we know that in terms of um, oh, lots of developmental psychology that we know that reading together is fundamentally important for language skills and we know that when we engage in uh, shared book reading this is really can be very very beneficial for vocabulary learning but also for children's later reading so children who understand how a book functions um, uh, are generally children who start to read earlier and what the kind of process that has had, the evidence-based process for reading is a, a process called talk, read and expand. So the best, the best evidence suggests that if we are reading a book together, we should first talk about the images that are on the page. So try and get the child to have a little look at the images and engage in what the story might be about. Then read the text to your child and then ask a question, expand. So this is the, the best evidence that suggests that engaging in that type of process through book reading is how we have didactic, so kind of back and forth communication around the storybook, and we expand our children's vocabulary. So talk, describe the images, what we can see, think about what the story might be happening, then we read the text, and then we expand by asking some questions. What might happen next? What, how, does, how do you think that this mummy might feel? Um, et cetera, et cetera, those types of things. Now, the really important thing about number and books, we see that from some trials, so some intervention studies which have provided parents with number books, we see that this increases the amount of mathematical language that parents are using, and math language is really, really fundamentally important at this stage, um, and also improves children's math skills. So the more we as parents talk about mathematics, the more um, our children are interested in mathematics, and the more they use math skills. But the important thing here is you don't need to have maths books, specific maths books, to be able to talk about mathematics. So for example, in this picture, I can ask um, my child, how many flowers are there here in this image? 
um, uh, what about how many, um, how many parents are there? How many leaves are on the ground? Um, we could talk about um, what is bigger. Is the daddy bigger than the mommy or the daddy bigger than the daddy, et cetera? Um, you know, th this type of language that we could use in terms of who's shorter, who's taller, who's on the left, who's on the right. We can use all those types of questions to focus on the mathematical content in the images. We don't need specific maths books. However, there are some really great math books out there that we can also use. So for example, this book is really lovely. It's called How Many, and it's by Christopher Danielson. And in this book, there's very little written content except for the words, how many? And the nice thing about this book is we can show children these images and they can count whatever they want. They can count the number of spaces within the egg carton. They can count the number of eggs. They can count the number of eggs in the frying pan. They can count anything. And the, bi the big thing about this book is you're letting your child spontaneously focus on mathematical content in the environment to count. And they are the people who can choose what they want to count. So this book is really lovely because it does allow us to have a slightly more um, uh, mathematical information in, in this book, but it's, it's no better than just a normal storybook that we can ask certain questions about mathematical content. And I think then also this book that um, Christopher Danielson has also produced, which is called Which One Doesn't Belong, is also about shape and children being able to find shapes that don't belong um, in the set. So that again, they're kind of having to make up their own ideas about shape and space. So we don't need specific books in terms of promoting mathematical skills, but we as parents can really support that, um, those, support those mathematical skills by talking, by reading and by expanding. I think that that really brings us to the kind of crux of what we wanted to be able to communicate with you today around mathematical language. And what we see is that children who have good grasp of mathematical language, so more, less, taller, shorter, not necessarily being able to, having good, a good grasp of what a number word means, but talking about that broader mathematical language, really equips them to be able to learn math in the school environment. So being able to be exposed to that mathematical language in the home, even though it might feel like you're not doing lots of math um, with your children, sometimes just using those types of mathematical words can be really helpful for your child's learning. So I think that that is all of our activities from within our little pack. Um, I hope you are inspired to do some of those activities with your children at home. Um, and I would really highly recommend the, the links that are in this slide. So what we're gonna do is send out this video, um, link, this, this video to everybody who has registered for the event. And you can check out some of these um, web resources as well. So the EYFS Home um, website has lots of um, interesting information that you can use, with, um, lots of interesting resources and ideas that you can use with your child at home in terms of mathematical play. The Dream Network, has amazing uh, family maths activities that can be really, really interesting. Hungry Little Minds campaign is also a, gov is a government backed um, charity, a government backed initiative, which has lots of resources and ideas. And then the good old BBC, Tiny Happy People has lots of ideas that we can do to play with our children. And I suppose I just want to finish um, just highlighting, I suppose, with the BBC that one of the things that we found from our research program is that children who children are watching mathematical content on iPads or TV and are playing mathematical games on um, pieces of technology. And I think that's absolutely fine because we have and the and that that type of environment can really help support mathematical learning as long as we're doing things with concrete shapes and spaces as well they are really important too but the dream network that's the second link in the list has a little um a, a little uh list of some good evidence-based high quality um apps that can be downloaded onto technology and that i think is really really useful because some usually parents ask us what what app would you recommend? And I can't really stand over that at all because I haven't done that research. But um, the Dream Network have, and they have some good suggestions of free um, apps that you can use on technology. So um, technology can be really helpful and really useful as long as we're still doing all of that creative play at home. Now, I think I would like to see if we have any questions um, in the chat box. So I just need to be able to 
open this up. Oh my goodness. There's... Okay, so I'm going to go straight. Okay, so the first question was from Claudia, which says, at what age do kids associate the number word to the number symbol? That's a really good um, question. So what we see is actually quite a large amount of variation in terms of when children associate number words with number symbols. And that we would describe as quite a formal skill. Um, but we know that within our data, some preschoolers are starting to be able to do that. So, you know, the three and a half to four and a half years, we're starting to be able to associate those number words with number symbols. It's quite a lot, what we would describe it as having a lot of variations. So some kids are very good at it and some kids are finding that much more difficult. And um, it's not necessarily something that it, we need to drill or focus on within the home environment. Um, it's much more important to be able to map the number words to the quantity. That's the fundamental bit that we really need to know in the preschool setting. Um, but exposure to number symbols in books, for example, or with your little toys that we're playing with um, can be very helpful. But it, it, we see lots of variation in preschoolers, um, but really the big focus is mapping those number words to the quantity, so two, for example. Um, oh, sorry, um, and Abby has literally just said that exactly the same thing. <laughs> um, and that's brilliant. So this, this guy is called, um, Christopher Danielson, and he's the guy with these lovely books, these, this lovely word. There, I'm sure there are many other mathematical counting books, but I, I think these are really lovely. And he is a researcher himself. So this has come from a research base um, and you know, very simple books. And I think they were, uh, I think I purchased them for five points. You know, they're, they're, so they're not, you know, they're, they're a reasonable, reasonable cost, I think. Um, then, um, okay, so, do we have any other questions? Oh, Claudia said, is there a gender difference concerning the early mathematical skills of kids? Right, this is where it gets really interesting. So what we see is um, that there is no difference in skills that children are presenting. So boys and girls, little boys and girls are showing exactly the same level. There's no gender difference in the skills that these kids have. They present with the same skills, but they're being exposed to slightly different things. So we do know from things like the Millennium Cohort Study that little boys are being exposed more to things like building blocks. Now that does seem, that potentially could have a long-term impact, um, but it's not necessarily about a long-term impact on their skills, but it's a long-term impact on their confidence um, and their competency about using those types of things. And we actually, you know, there's some people argue quite strongly that that exposure to building blocks at early in life and in, in children's early um, in early learning careers um, may have impact on career choices much later on. So maybe this kind of exposure early in the home environment may have, now this is quite a large leap to make, is may have impacts on the choices, for example, going into engineering and um, into the built environment, those types of, of, of um, broader careers um, may be kind of founded at, at the home because of the home environment. But we do know that the, the children are being exposed to slightly different things in the home because of because of their gender. Do we have any more questions? Abby, is there anything you would like to say just to finish up? Um, no, I think they were great questions. Oh, we've got another. Oh, this will be good, good for your research. Oh, hello, Judith. Any research with premature babies? Yeah, actually, um, all of my a good component of my research is on um, prematurity and the impact of um, preterm birth on uh, well, on cog cognitive skills that children um, present with who are born prematurely. Now, the first thing that I always like to say is um, uh, we do group differences, so we recruit babies who are born very preterm, so less than 32 weeks gestation, and maybe compare them to children in their classroom. And not all children born preterm struggle with um, thinking skills or math skills, but we see as a group premature children struggling with mathematics. Um, and one of the reasons that we have done some research to try and understand why that might be, and what we think is actually um, that very preterm children present with two major issues. One is working memory, so holding things in your mind and manipulating it at the same time. Kind of if I asked you to do like seven multiplied by eight, you're doing, you're holding things in your mind and trying to work your way through that information. Um, and we also know that um, very preterm children have issues um, on the main with visual spatial skills. So might find that type of task, you know, that kind of pattern, pattern matching task quite difficult. 
And so what we find is um, that, uh, uh, that these um, general cognitive issues may drive problems with um, mathematics skills. I've just popped into the box this web address preterm, oh sorry, preterm, it's preterm birth dot info. Um, and that website is a really, um, we think we're very proud of it, it's had like 14,000 users, um, a really accessible one hour training workshop on um, preterm birth, it, the potential impact that preterm birth may have on cognition and educational outcomes, um, and specifically focusing on maths and also some really um, good tips that have been generated by teachers to think about how we might help support math learning in prematurely born children. So that resource is free, accessible, use it, promote it, give it out to everyone. Um, and uh, hopefully you, you'll be able to find out more information about prematurity and mathematics skills within that. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for coming along. I hope you like the little pack. I know that there were quite a few people who were kind of trickling in later and we totally get it. Family life is, is quite mad. Um, so if you um, missed some of the start of the, the session, don't worry, we're gonna take this video, we're gonna put and send you all the web links so you can have a little look at what we have um, and see that, you know, hear the answers, etc. cetera. Um, and thank you so much for coming along. Um, hope you enjoyed it and um, if you have any queries or questions um, my email address is v.sims with two m's at ulster.ac.uk um, and you're more than welcome to email us um, to ask more questions but thank you so much and I'm gonna just stop recording um, and uh, have a lovely Monday. Bye! Thank you.